Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. On this week's episode, you've been waiting for it, a question on infant baptism. Oh yeah, let's get the fight on. Stick around. But first, it's time for your issues, etc. Question of the week. Pastor Fisk, was the Last Supper a Passover Seder meal? <laughs> no, I know this is a very popular notion in Christianity right now. Is it well founded? <laughs> No. What problems could arise from this belief? Uh, letting the Pharisees tell you who Jesus was. Sound like a bad idea? Because that's basically what it is. I've seen some Hebrew roots literature use this notion to twist the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Yeah, that'd be my point. It's amazing how American Christians are so divorced from the scriptures that they will look anywhere to understand what the scriptures say except for the scriptures themselves and particularly to what Jesus says about his own meal. I and mean, what does he say on the night he's betrayed? Does he say, by the way, guys, you got to understand everything I'm doing here through the traditions of the elders that I've been speaking against so vividly for the last three years. No, he says, take eat this is my body, right? This is the forgiveness of sins. This is the New Testament. New Testament. I'm not doing the old covenant. I'm doing the New Testament in my blood. Yeah? Should I say it again? The rise of popular Seder meals is almost directly connected to this lack of understanding of the real physical presence of Christ in the sacrament as the heart and life of the church. And churches that don't have that have to look somewhere for some kind of meaning for their symbolism. And so what do they end up doing? Asking modern day Judaism, which is the synagogal tradition, which is the last living vessel vestiges of the Pharisees and their traditions of the elders. Dr. Daniel Gard, a former professor at Concordia Fort Wayne, current president at Concordia University, River Forest, i.e. Chicago, and if I'm not mistaken, an admiral in the Navy, has written extensively on this and been issued on and been issued <laughs> and been interviewed on issues, etc. I recommend you start with that interview right there in the links below. It's so good they keep airing it over and over again. Just like you do, playing Worldview Everlasting on your computer all day long every day, right? No, but you can do that with the Issues Etc. talk radio station 24 hours a day. Check that out too. Email. Dear Pastor, to follow up on your recent Truth or Reason video, how much historical support does infant baptism have? Would you say it was a majority opinion? Your show is excellent. Please rock on. Signed, a Reformed Baptist. Would I say it was a majority opinion? Mm-hmm and uh-huh and like there's no question about that. So when we talk about baptism and the baptism of infants, we have a whole bunch of stuff, lots of baggage to deal with. We got what does the scriptures say? We got where did we have the arising of the, the rebaptizing and the Anabaptist style theology? which isn't really around today uh, in the way it was in Luther's time, but has come up again through the Baptists that are actually out of the Reformed in the Church of England. This is also connected to the movement of the Reformation, but that's also connected to the shift from supernatural believing Middle Ages to the more rationalist thinking, scientifically minded modernism. There's a ton of things to deal with, and we can't deal with all of them in this video. What we're going to do is address that particular question. Is the baptism of infants a majority position in the ancient church? And the question question undeniably is yes, with one exception, the Gnostics. And if you know your history, you know the Gnostics aren't the side you want to be on. These are the people who deny that Jesus is God. <laughs> All right, so anyway, here we go. I'm gonna be using for this video excerpts from Joachim Jeremias's Infant Baptism in the First Four Centuries. It looks like it's a small book, but it's slow reading, it's intense, it's scholarship. He also follows this up with a rebuttal to Kurt Allen called The Origins of Infant Baptism because Kurt Allen didn't like this book and so he tried to poke some holes in it and then this book is written to be like, dude, those aren't holes, like you're cheating. So I recommend both these books. Be aware that Jeremias was a historical critic, which is fascinating in this. He gives less power, as it were, to the scriptures. He is less willing to believe their veracity. And you might think that this would lead a person to, like, wonder since the scriptures don't mention specifically the baptism of an infant. But it's quite the opposite of that. Nonetheless, he is still convinced of the, well, orthodox position. So I'm going to be using some of his book, but if you want more, you know, get this book. I'm not going to be able to cover it all. So where do we start? Well, where we really need to start is in one of these old world to modern world shifts that we don't even think about anymore. And that is the idea of 
corporate personality. Anyone in Western civilization is raised with the assumption that you are an individual. You are someone separate from your parents. But this is totally foreign to the ancient world. In one sense, it's a result of the understanding of Christian salvation and the value of individual people in God's sight. In another sense, it's a heightening of the arrogance of our original sin to think that somehow I am in fact entirely distanced from my heritage and parentage. In the ancient world, just wasn't the way that people thought. And you cannot be an honest person and apply the assumptions of our day to the realities of that world. For us today, we think of it as almost immoral if we say, well, the father believes this, so therefore all the household also would have to believe that. But that was just the way it was. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. This is what they meant by community. This thing that we're always seeking for, we can't find. Well, we can't find it because we insist on being individuals. We are unwilling to in any way bend ourselves in subjection to a head. Bow to your sensei! Out of your sensei. And we even see this corporate identity spoken of in the scriptures. In one of the classic, they don't mention a baby here texts, Acts 16, the jailer speaks to Paul and Silas and receives this very fascinating answer. He says, I, singular, he says, sirs, plural, what must I, singular, do that I, singular, may be saved? And they, plural, said, believe, singular, on the Lord Jesus, and you, singular, shall be saved, and your house. When you believe, they they believe. It's assumed. It wasn't like now we have to go and convince each one to make their decision for Jesus. And the modern, rationalist, individualistic Christian, applying their assumptions born from the age more than from scripture, would have to see this as like amoral. How could it be possible that they would believe just because dad believes they haven't actually given their life to Jesus yet? That's impossible. Well, it doesn't matter. They are in their father, spiritually. And this is still more true today than we realize. Although, to be sure, there was a corrective that ancient Christianity does bring to this because it was willing to accept converts that were coming away from the religion of their parents or their husband. But you just can't escape that the conversion of the jailer, the conversion of the father implies the salvation of his entire household. It's corporate. This solidarity of the life of the family was so taken for granted, the fact that children were never regarded as isolated units of humanity from their family was so obvious to everyone that it in itself becomes the best explanation for why the particular baptism of infants is never bothered to be mentioned in the New Testament. I'm not making an argument from silence. I'm saying there's a reason there's silence. And that reason is something that the arguers against this position assume is wrong in their culture. But the other culture has a different view than they do. All right, that's just where we start, right? Then there's this other thing which has to influence this a little bit called proselyte baptism. This is the baptism of pagans into Judaism, which began before Christian times and nonetheless has striking similarities to Christian baptism. Jeremiah details it very, very meticulously. But what we really want to be interested in is the question, well, did this baptism that was so similar to Christianity Christian baptism, which then Jesus kind of takes and makes Christian baptism by like doing his own thing, did this first one involve children? And the answer is clearly yes. The oldest rabbinic sources, the Taneatic tradition, gives numerable instances of children, babies, being received through proselyte baptism, being received into the Jewish faith with their parents. And it had particular rules. For example, if a mother is pregnant and is going to become a Jew, and the baby is born before she is baptized a Jew, the infant was to be baptized along with her at her baptism. If the baby is born afterwards, there's no baptism because the baby is born a Jew. The case is not even mentioned and it would it would have no reason to be mentioned because it was unbelievable of an instance where both father and mother are converted to Judaism and then the children are not. The girls were baptized, the boys were baptized after being circumcised. Which, interestingly enough, points us to Colossians chapter 2 where circumcision and baptism have a strange connection. So now there's like a whole bunch more historical evidence for this. Hippolytus describes the same thing happening in Christian churches long before his own time, as early as the second century, at the festival of Easter, entire families converted together were admitted to the church and the Lord's Supper for the first time through baptism. And the children were baptized first, the infants were baptized first, and then the parents followed, including those who could not speak for themselves. Tertullian, another church father, the first to report to us the custom of godparents who exist because they come and take part of a baptismal ceremony, making promises for the future instruction and growth of a child who cannot speak for themselves. So what we see is that the church in early times by no means attempts to tear asunder the corporate value of the family by making some people Christians and others, well, just kind of not. And remember, this is a time when everybody also assumes that baptism does work the forgiveness of sins. That isn't even questioned at this time.
You even have the inscription on children's tombstones bearing evidence. Not that this is an exciting thing, right? But it's important. One inscription from the third century has a very fascinating twist to it. It goes like this. Dedicated to the departed, Florentius made this inscription for his worthy son, Apronianus, who lived one year and nine months and five days. As he was truly loved by his grandmother and she knew that death was eminent, she asked the church that he might depart from the world as a believer. Now you have a case here of primitive, emergency, infant baptism. Ha ha! See, they didn't baptize infants unless they were going to die. Well, but see, they baptized the infant. And there is a little another piece here going on. The mention of the grandmother interceding in order to get the child baptized does imply that the father, Florentius, wasn't actually a Christian, but a pagan. And this is confirmed by the strikingly pagan description of death dedicated to the departed. That phraseology of departing and passing on is pagan language, even though we Christians kind of use it today, and I try to catch myself when I do. They're dead, right? It's a different thing. You have in this tombstone unquestionable evidence of a missionary baptism administered to a dying non-Christian baby. Now, you also have this interesting reality that in the first century, we actually don't have any of this kind of historical special evidence. We just have the scriptures themselves. But then in the second century, you have historical evidence showing that the baptism of infants is taken for granted. On top of this, the amount of evidence is quite large of this taking of it for granted. Delay of baptism in the case of Christian children born to two Christian parents was entirely unknown in the early church. It is not until 329 that we have evidence of anyone letting a child grow up unbaptized in a Christian household. There's nothing in the church describing two kinds of Christians, baptized Christians and unbaptized Christians. To be baptized is to be Christian, and to not be baptized is to remain not a Christian. Now, of course, this doesn't undermine that you can be saved by grace through faith by believing in the promise of the gospel, right? But then what does that gospel do? It says, come, get more gospel. And yes, 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 the thief on the cross. We've talked about this in other places. The thief on the cross had something that you don't have. He had Jesus particularly and individually and physically right there giving him a special ITU promise. The thief on the cross is a great example of baptism. You need an ITU promise from Jesus. That's what baptism gives you individually. But nowhere before 329 is there even a discussion. Well, should we baptize infants? Should we not baptize infants? There's just historical evidence of it being done. If this was a new thing being introduced at any time, it would have been talked about. Also, the fact that there's no like special right for baptizing babies, like they would have done something new if they were doing something new, but there was only one baptismal rite, generally speaking, that existed and built and grew, the same one that we in Lutheranism use today. It is not until Tertullian begins to argue against infant baptism, based on his movement toward a cult in which he maybe did cease to be a Christian, it's not until him that we have anyone mention an argument against it, and he argues against it, taking for granted that everybody's doing it, and that it's always been done. You go further down in history, it just gets more and more established. Origen, another heretic who actually still might have remained a Christian at his death, and it's hard to say, three times mentions the baptism of infants as a custom of the church. And by that, he means from the apostles. So as the Gnostic sects begin to arise, stopping people from baptizing infants, you finally have the church beginning to say, no, 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 you need to baptize infants. This is, you know, you go to these places where they don't do that, you're going outside the church. I'm not saying Baptists today are outside the church, right? But the Gnostics were. All right, it goes on more and more and more, even pictures of engravings and whatnot. But it pretty much should go without question, no matter what side of the, what does the Bible say debate you fall on, the question, what is the early history majority demonstrate Christians were doing from AD 70 up until the 300s when the Gnostics who don't even believe Christianity at all and are a full-on cult and heresy begin to pull it away. What does the early church do? Unanimously, they baptize the babies. And even before that, going into earlier centuries, the Jews were doing the same. Tradition and history is not the linchpin in the theology that we teach. It is scripture. But when scripture, in fact, teaches that baptism saves, that households are baptized, God's word is the power to create and do things that we can't create and do, we would need some pretty explicit text from scripture to overturn a tradition that seems to be based on what scripture actually says. We would need an example of a baby not being baptized. Now, we actually have sort of the opposite of that too, where the disciples are trying to keep Jesus from blessing the little babies, and Jesus is like, no, 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 these ones, they're easy, they don't fight back, yeah? Bring them to me, let me bless them. And for once and for all, can we at least admit that if I've made any arguments from silence, the argument that we don't have examples of babies baptized in the New Testament is also an argument from silence. And based on that argument, we can't baptize babies because I don't see an individual baby being baptized in the New Testament. Therefore, we cannot commune women. Women can't have the Lord's Supper because there is no example of them in the New Testament. Now, that's insane, right? I agree, that's insane. But that's the same argument that's being made as a like once for all thing. The thief on the cross and I don't see babies. I see dead people. 
is just, that's not enough to overturn what scripture does so clearly say about baptism. And it all comes back to that. I love you, Reformed Baptists, especially because you understand justification, you understand grace. And you gotta see that at least from our perspective, it is a rejection of that thing you hold so dear, grace, which keeps you from baptizing the baby. A baptism of an infant is the best example of pure grace. The baby does nothing. The baby doesn't deserve it at all. The baby might as well be dead. Although if he was dead, it wouldn't work, but that's a different story. The baby brings nothing to the baptism, just as you, as an adult, even believing in Jesus because he's awakened you from death to life, you're still bringing nothing to your baptism. God is doing it all. Same thing at the Lord's Supper. You bring nothing. You bring doubt and unbelief and sin, and God comes with righteousness. From our perspective, this is all bound up in the same question. Jesus bought justification on the cross, and now his word and his sacraments are doing that justifying to you, both at the beginning of your Christian life and throughout it. In your death, you die in Christ so that just as he's raised from the dead, you will rise in him. And baptism is in the context of that text in scripture. At the end of the day, if you really want to understand why Lutherans are crazy about this, you just got to go to every mention of the word baptism outside of the book of Acts, which is describing what's going on. And we're not against the book of Acts, but don't start there. Go to every other text in the New Testament from Paul and from Peter that says the word baptism in it and let the words as they sit on the page remain true. Do not replace the word baptism with some other definition of baptism yanked out of the air. Oh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't see that anywhere in scripture apart from baptism itself. We do see the Holy Spirit falling on groups of people in the book of Acts in order to demonstrate that God is giving to the Gentiles, to the nations, his faith as well. This often is connected to the laying out of hands by the apostles, but it's also connected to the preaching of the word. So that doesn't undo or overturn everything else that Jesus said. In fact, the first thing Peter says after he sees that they have the Holy Spirit is, oh my goodness, I guess we should baptize them because it's weird that they got the Holy Spirit without that. And we got to like put the stuff back together. Let's, let's clean it up. Wash, wash, wash. <laughs> so Lutherans, we're just stuck on what the text says. And you're going to have to show us texts from scripture that say that those texts are wrong if you're ever going to convince us to change the way we see this. You can't just wag your finger at the thief on the cross. It's not enough. And I actually think it's on our side. I baptize you. I tell you today, if you die, you're with me in paradise. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Worldview Everlasting. I hope I wasn't too offensive to those of you who totally disagree with me today. I try not to be. You know I love you. I hope you understand. It's all in good fun. Yes. I don't intend to be snarky, but I am passionate about this stuff as I hope you are passionate about your views of what God's holy word says, unalterably so, as well. If you like what we do here, $5 a month goes a long way to getting this gospel out into the internet, supports things like the Around the Word devotions, and gradually is working our way toward where we can get Peter Slayton out on the road visiting conferences of non-Lutherans and handing out examples of the good theology you get here at Worldview Everlasting. You can like, subscribe, and share this video. Though again, be careful where you put this thing. I mean, you don't want to fight with the person who's not ready to kind of reckon with it. But if you're in a place with somebody who can actually, you know, learn or at least have their beliefs challenged without necessarily freaking out, you know, by all means, make use. Until next time, this is a baptized sinner. Thanks be to God that salvation's come to me, not by my works, not a bit, but I know it because he said, I wash you and I believe it. Amen. I don't feel it, but I believe it. Amen. Baptized sinner, Pastor Fisk, telling you to rock on. Do you like sushi? Yeah!